Welcome back to Ask Austin Harley. Today is going to be a little bit different of a topic if you've been following me so far. You've noticed that a lot of my videos are about credit repair, but today I kind of wanted to roll into the real estate aspect of things and it's going to be about how to properly buy an investment property or a rental property. Now, a rental property has a few different aspects to it. I want to go over three of the biggest things to kind of restructure some of your minds and how to think about an investment property. So without further ado, let's jump right into the video. All right, so before I teach you a few different topics, if you haven't already, consider hitting the like button if you like the content in this video, and consider subscribing because my goal is to start shifting some of the videos that I'm making from credit repair because there's only so many videos you can make about repairing your credit back into real estate. And just so you know that I'm not just some random guy talking in front of a whiteboard like every other YouTuber out there, my name is Austin Harley. I created this YouTube channel around building credit, but I'm also a real estate agent in the Northern Virginia and Maryland area. I've done a ton of transactions. I have a small real estate team. You can check out my other channel, Austin Harley Group. It's all about me. You can go to my website as well and learn more about me and what I do. But regardless of that, the reason why I know how to teach this content is because I've had my own rental properties. I've made my own mess ups and I've learned from them very well, as well as being mentored from so many real estate investors in the area. And honestly, just a huge exposure to amount of transactions. Again, I'm a real estate agent, so I'm kind of the middleman between buyers and sellers and landlords and tenants as well. So I've seen where they've made mistakes. I've seen where I've made mistakes. I've also seen where my mentors have made mistakes as well. So a lot of this content is going to be straight from pure experience. Again, this channel is more about me teaching from my experience and hopefully learning from other people's experience as well so that you don't have to make the same exact mistake and you can chase financial freedom as well. But anyways, let's jump straight into the video. Okay, so let's jump into this roller coaster ride of excitement right here. <laughs> okay, so step number one or really question number one is money. Now, when you're buying a rental property, most people ask me, you need money. Most people think you need 20% down, and that's not entirely true. Some people think you need a conventional loan. That's not entirely true either. There's so many myths, I guess you would say market uh, industry standards that have just been thrown at the public that make people think that it's almost unattainable to buy rental properties. But realistically, you can get into a rental property in any way, shape, or form that you can. You just gotta be creative about it. So first things first is the question of how much money should I spend on a rental property? This comes up a lot, especially for me being in Northern Virginia. Some people want to get their foot through the door in buying real estate. And we have these notorious $500,000 two-car garage townhomes that are just, in my opinion, a complete ripoff, but they're beautiful. Uh, but a half a million dollars for a townhouse just sounds crazy, especially looking at it from a nationwide standpoint. So the whole question is, how much should you actually spend on a investment property? Obviously, you're going to need a down payment, but I don't recommend you going to buy a $500,000 townhouse unless it's going to produce you a huge sum of return on investment. Now, the way that I'm going to explain this to you is extremely important. That's why I made it the first tip. So the first question is, how much? Let's break it down like this. You're buying a $500,000 townhouse. Put a buy right there. And the rent on that property, let's just call it $2,600. Let's say you put down a modest 15% because you got a good deal on it. How much money is 15%? Let me check really quick because I should know this, especially if I'm a real estate agent. That's $75,000 that you got to put down. Again, you may not have this, doesn't matter. We're just using this for simplicity. So you got to put down 75K, D for down right there in order to rent it out for 2600 So using a standard mortgage calculator, we can estimate our payment, monthly payment, is going to be 2500 roughly. Now if you got a $2,500 mortgage hanging above your head, that doesn't even include the HOA too, which is crazy. You can only rent it out for 2600 being conservative. Maybe you can push out to 2700 but my rule of thumb is that if you cannot make your tenant happy and you overcharge for rent, they're just going to leave and it's going to lose you more money in the long run. And if you're planning on purchasing a rental property, you probably want to keep it for the long run. So you usually charge just right below market value to keep your tenants happy and keep them in there. It causes you less headache anyway. But regardless, you're only making $100 a month off this, which is crazy. So you bought a $500,000 asset you put 75K down, not even including closing costs or anything like that, and you have a mortgage balance of 425,000, and you're only making $100 a month. This is the way that I want you to think about this. Pay attention, this is extremely important. How many months of you collecting $100 a month in profit is it going to take you to get your $75,000 back? 
it's probably going to be an astronomical amount of months to get that money back. So I'm going to go ahead and put an X through this because this is not the correct way to buy real estate as an investor. Now granted, there's two different goals that you have whenever you buy rental property. You can have the rental, the goal of getting the highest ROI, which is the return on investment, what we talked right there. Let me write that down over here. ROI, or you can have the goal of going after some instant equity. Now, instant equity is huge, but the problem is you can't really use it unless you either get a cash out refinance to access that money or you get some sort of HELOC. And when you're buying an investment property, getting a HELOC is just a lot more ex extenuous and there's just so many other curveballs you have to throw at the bank. They don't loan up to 90 or 100% LTV just like a primary residence would. Now let's take a second scenario of buying a little bit cheaper of a house and take a look at how much more ROI we can produce. Start tracking the data. Ask your local realtor to run some numbers for you of market industry standards to see what the rent is doing in certain areas. The approximate cost to buy a three bedroom, two and a half bath townhouse without a garage is gonna be around 300K. Now let's do it right here. Get on my knees here for you guys. 300K, and let's say you put down the same 15%. So you got 300,000 times 0.15, 45,000 right there. Again, you don't need to have this money, but I'm just giving you clean cut examples to keep the math straight. And that $300,000 townhouse is obviously not going to rent for 2,600 again, because that's just insane. But let's say the average rent is going to be 1,900. Know your market so you can find the highest rental rate per cost. That's the whole goal of this video is to figure out what that is. Now I just ran the numbers on that. Your mortgage rate roughly is going to be around 1560. Now what's your cash flow? If you do simple math, that's $340 in cash flow. How many months will it take you to get your, uh, what is that, 40, I can't even read my own handwriting, $45,000 back. That is a much better designed rental for you. Now, here's how we're gonna take it to another level and kind of part two of the whole money situation, which is what type of loan should you get, so hang tight. Okay, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this topic because it's not really a huge one, but what type of loan should you get on an investment property? You have three different options. You can get private lending, you can get Fannie Freddie, like conventional FHA loans, government back loans, anything of that sort, or you can get cash. Cash is another option, but again, uh, let's go through these and figure out what's gonna be the best bet. So let's say you have cash just sitting in a bank and you just wanna buy some real estate because everyone told you it's the best thing in the world to do and you're gonna be rich if you buy real estate. So let's say you have that same scenario, $300,000 in cash, $300,000 and you're collecting $1,900 in rent. How long is that gonna take you to get your money back? I don't know how long that is, but it's a pretty long time. Personally, me, I think buying cash for investment properties such as rentals is not the best idea unless you just literally have millions of dollars in the bank. But that is an option right there. So you got number one. The second option is to get a conventional loan. Let's say you're getting a conventional loan, you're buying it as a primary residence. Most lenders are gonna require you a minimum of 15% down to 25% down, just depending on the property. However, the benefit of getting a conventional loan is that they're less strict on their guidelines. So loans like VA loans are extremely strict, FHA, if they see water stains in the ceiling or anything like that, they usually won't lend to you, they'll require the seller pass inspection per FHA guidelines or VA guidelines. Conventional loans really don't care as much. Now they still do, appraisers still do write up stuff, but it's case by case. I mean, if you're buying a house that's like completely just wrecked, then they may not lend to you. But again, that's kind of the pros versus cons of getting a conventional loan. Ideally, if you're buying a house purposely for an investment property, meaning you are never gonna live in there and then move out, then you're probably gonna be stuck in that 15 to 25%. Unless we go around, and I'm gonna teach you this in probably the next few minutes, and find a property below market value so you don't have to put down as much money. I'm gonna to touch on that, so stay tuned to the video. The third thing is an FHA loan. So we just talked about it. These are mainly for buying primary residence. Don't commit mortgage fraud, I'm not telling you to do that at all. But what a lot of people are doing, if you're smart, is they're moving into their primary residence, designing them to be bulletproof rentals, which I will make in another video someday. So FHA, VA, so what people are doing, and this is what I do myself, is every primary that I buy, I buy with the intention to live in it for a set amount of time and then I move out and rent it. That way I can get away with very low down payments. Some people even do 1% or 0% down payments. You can do the 3.5. You can even get grants if it's your first time buying a home. Now, the problem is you don't have that much equity in the house, so you're not gonna necessarily cash flow like we talked about before, which defeats the whole purpose 
of the ROI that we talked about right here. Now remember I said there's two different ways. The second way is you can get uh, an investment property for a rental if you get instant equity. Now um, with instant equity, let's take an example of a property that is worth 300,000 on paper, ARV, after repair values, and let's say you're picking it up for 250,000, and I'm gonna teach you later on in other videos how to get deals like that. That means the purchase price, PP, don't have any dirty thoughts about that. Put 10% down, which is 25K out of pocket. Not right sideways today. Down payment, DP. And uh, obviously, return on investment is a lot higher. I'm not gonna do the math. You can see the difference. On paper, you made 50,000. And let's say the repairs that you need, let's say it needs 10K in work. Paint, carpet, cosmetics. So all in, you're all in 35,000 in cash, all in, but you bought the house for 250, you spent 10K on it, so you're all in technically 260 if you look at it from the big picture, but now that you have 25K in down, your loan is at 225 and you have $75,000 in equity that you could leverage. Again, there's no right or wrong decision, I'm just teaching you little loopholes that you can get through this with what type of loan to get for an investment property. We're gonna move on to another topic, which is what type of property should you get, so stay tuned. Okay, so if you made it this far in this video, that means you're probably paying attention and not falling asleep at your keyboard, so go ahead and give me a thumbs up for the YouTube algorithm. Go ahead and subscribe if you like my content so far. I'm gonna put out a lot more videos on being a landlord, so on and so forth, property management, getting your house market ready. You're probably bored of me saying that, so just go ahead and subscribe. But anyway, what type of property should you purchase? Let's break it this down as factual and as simple as possible, okay? You have a few different options. I don't know why I wrote five there. Single family home, S, F, H. You got a townhouse, great option. Town home. You got a condo. And of course you got a multi-family, but nobody cares about that. We're just going to talk about the main ones that you find in suburbs the majority of starter rental landlords like you. Let's say, let's compare these all, okay? So single family home has a few benefits. It's a higher price, so you get a higher amount of principal pay down, higher pay down, right there. Con is it has more maintenance. It's a bigger house, so you got more maintenance. More maintenance, I, I, I don't know, I'm just gonna put MNT if you can read my handwriting. And uh, let's think about logically what else there is. Single family home, you got a higher pay down. You got another con, which is a bigger down payment. DP. Now, there's probably gonna be some people in the comment section that are gonna say single family homes are the best for rentals, and I'm not saying they're not. Those are the pros and cons over here. It looks like we got two cons, and we got one pro. So, townhouse. It's gonna be a lower principal pay down. Lower PP. Uh, we got less maintenance. It's a smaller house, so you got less maintenance. Smaller down payment. Uh, and then you got a condo, which is kind of unique. I'm gonna draw an arrow down here. So it's a super low, super low principal pay down. You have a lot less maintenance, because think about it. Condo, usually you don't even have to maintenance the windows, it's just kind of all built in there running out of room on this whiteboard. And then on top of that, the third thing is, the third thing is you have an extremely small, extreme small down payment. So which one do you do? Oh, there's one more variable on here, and that's that you're gonna have a condo fee. Oh man, that's a whole nother video we can make about that as well. So let's compare these. Single family homes are fantastic. Uh, if you get the right ones with the wood pane windows, the ones that are built very, very well, just the standard colonial, maybe even split foyers and ramblers are good because they're kind of tiny. Um, but the problem is, it's just more maintenance, more damage that a tenant could do, in my opinion. And I've seen so many people, especially in this area, just get screwed over and over and over. And there's a lot of different variables to go into that, but in a nutshell, it's just going to be more expensive, bigger down payment, more maintenance. Uh, but you're buying a bigger house, so if you get a better deal getting some instant equity like we talked about here, you could get a more instant equity. So that's also something to consider as well. If you're a starter landlord, I would recommend you to start out with either a townhome or a condo. But we can jump into the pros and cons of that right now. If a tenant literally destroys your property, how much more, how much more is it going to cost you to repair that single family home versus a small townhome or condo? Plus, townhome and condos are way easier to rent out. Um, they may have a little bit more turnover, but again, you're going to see, weigh it on the scale, figure out what's best for you in your market. But the trade-off on a single family home is that it's more expensive so that you can possibly get a better deal on it, getting some of this instant equity that we talked about earlier. 
I'm probably gonna put together a whole video on instant equity, how to find those deals, and uh, so on and so forth. But regardless, townhomes, condos, let's focus on that. Townhomes are perfect for rentals, especially in Northern Virginia and Maryland, because you can get such fantastic deals on them. You can find so many distressed townhome properties. There's no insanely high condo fee. Again, when you're thinking about a rental property, you need to think about what your cost of money is coming out and how much equity or net worth are you building back by cash flow, uh, pay, principal pay down, so on and so forth. Um, and with a condo, because of that condo fee down there, sometimes it's two, three hundred dollars a month. That just goes straight to the trash. Same thing with HOA fees. Find something with a relatively low HOA fee, but don't make your decision solely off that. The trade-off is a condo has an extremely low, for the most part, I mean, unless you're buying like Reston Town Center, which is like the mini New York City of Virginia. So a, a condo could, for the most part, have an extremely low purchase price, but a higher condo fee. So you get to see the trade-off right there. Just weigh out the down payments, go to that Zillow mortgage calculator to give a rough idea of what's going on. Talk to your lender, talk to your accountant. This is more of just a guide for you on what type of property to buy. Personally, me, all day long, I would buy townhomes unless you're subleasing them and you're a little bit more experienced, get a single family home. I personally always stay away from condos because that condo fee. So we're gonna jump into the third thing in this video, which is gonna be location. How far away should you buy these rentals? So there's a lot of aspects to this. I've spent so much time on this video already, I'm gonna have to edit it down. So I'm not gonna touch too much on it, but if you have any questions or I missed or skipped anything that's just dying on your brain, leave it in the comment section. I will make a specific video literally about that just for you. So location. I have this kind of like made up thing, it's called the Landlord's Bible. I'm probably gonna make a video about it or make a little ebook about it anyway, but my number one rule that I tell people all the freaking time is the one hour rule. Now, what is this? This means, and actually I got this to give credit from a, a YouTuber called Phil Pustyovsky. He's an awesome real estate investor. The one hour rule means do not buy a rental that's more than an hour away from you. Now, people are gonna be literally flipping S-H-I-T when I say this. So leave it in the comment section below because there's so many people that are like, oh, Baltimore is fantastic for rentals. You can get these cheap rentals. This is, again, this is just from my cold hearted experience. Um, so the one hour rule, the reason why, is because if something breaks, and I don't recommend you to have a property manager, you heard that right, I don't recommend you, I'll make a whole nother video about that as well. The one hour rule, if you have something broken in that property and you can't find a handyman, or you physically have to drive out there on a Sunday when you're trying to spend time with your family, you're gonna pull your hair out. If you have to do quarterly checkups on this property, or even monthly checkups in this property, like I would recommend in my landlord Bible, then you're gonna kill yourself for being an hour away. It's just gonna waste so much of your time. And it's very important that you understand, especially if you're a new landlord, that you wanna make this as simple as possible because real estate is financial freedom. If you do things the right way and you follow this uh, video guide and you do your research, do your due diligence, and you subscribe to my channel as well. But you wanna make it as easy as possible because I've seen so many people in real estate buy their primary, rent it out, get screwed by the tenants, and never buy a rental again. You're always going to win more than you lose as a real estate investor buying rentals or a landlord, whatever you wanna call it. Because most people don't have systems set up correctly, so it's kind of an uphill battle at first, but isn't everything that requires financial, I mean, the reward is financial freedom. You could own 10 to 20 properties, end up buying a multifamily. Don't beat yourself up just because you had one unsuccessful rental. You need to do it the proper way. So follow the one hour rule, in other words. You can buy out of state properties depending on your situation. I mean, there's so much gray area to this. But in a nutshell, if you have no properties, stick within one hour, know your market. So this was a list of just probably three of the biggest things. I touched on a lot of stuff. There's probably some gray area. You probably have some questions by now. Again, I've said it probably a million times, but go ahead and leave it in the comments section below and I'll do my best to make a, pri uh, a personal video for your question. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down with a smile and tell me what you hated about me in the comment section. But regardless of that, this is Ask Austin Harley signing off. Check out some of my other videos and I'll see you soon.